what we're going to do, we're going to jump into, pick up in the sort of a middle slide. And again, I want to make a distinction about righteousness that is given to us and righteousness that we are to live. But I'm not going to focus on righteousness specifically. We're probably, it's going how far I get, but we're probably going to get into sanctification. I'm going to go to the blackboard. I may go to both blackboards. I'm going to go to one blackboard for sure and then see how far we go. But what I'm seeing clearer myself is the, the absolute surety that God wants us thinking destiny. He wants us thinking and living destiny. Not saying, I know where I'm going to go when I die. Between now and then, I'm not so sure what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do that. We need, a, we need a paradigm shift change in our thinking that we live for destiny with God and then what we do as an occupation may or may not be specific from God, but that's not as important as that we're, we're eternal destiny minded because God is definitely eternal destiny minded. But now I'm pulling this back in to righteousness and us being in right standing with God, more to focus on the gift of righteousness and then make sure that we understand where that applies and where it, well, I'm not going to say it doesn't apply, but where it is a supportive role, a supportive role. That's, that's probably a good word I'll use tonight when we get that far. So now what I want to do, I want to read this and I've read it before. And this is to do with what I'm going to call the righteous requirement of righteousness, righteous requirement of righteousness. You've heard me talk about this. And this is why does God do what he does? Why did he choose to do things the way he chose to do them? And that is because he was making sure he stayed within the righteous requirement of righteousness. I want to read this through. We've read it before, but we have come to see that God himself holds himself to the standard of righteousness, not because righteousness is above him. Nothing is above him, but righteousness is something he is. Therefore, no matter what is at stake, meaning eternal destinies of human beings, no matter what is at stake, God will never violate righteousness. And the reason I've stuck with the term righteousness is because when you go and if you look in your Bible software about the use of the word righteousness, God uses that very often to describe what he does. Not just that he's doing something, but that he's doing it righteously or in righteousness, or it was a righteous decision or action that he did. So we should then ask, why does he use this term, this descriptive term to qualify what he does? Because it's important to him that he do things righteously because he knows that's a standard that can't be violated. And I'm saying that for us to get that in our thinking that we need to seriously evaluate our walk and its relationship to righteousness. I think we tend to be a little more loose with it than we should be when God takes righteousness very seriously. So let's go back and finish reading this. The result of the righteous requirement of righteousness defined what and who it would take to satisfy righteousness in justifying, sanctifying, and glorifying sinful men. 
Righteousness dictated the cost. Righteousness chose the son. See, now we, when we would say, and rightly so, we would say, well, God chose his son. God chose for the word to become flesh. God sent his son. It says that, and that is true. God did it, but God is righteous, and we've got to remember all of his decisions are done in righteousness. They're righteously done. Therefore, it was the righteous judgment of God that his son had to be sent. It required the word to become flesh. The son of God had to fulfill the requirement of righteousness. So that we understand what I'm saying, and the reason I'm emphasizing this, is we tend to think God arbitrarily said, okay, I think I will be satisfied for covering sins for a period of time. I'll be satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats. So we'll do that for a little while. And then, oh, I know what, I got an idea. I think I'll, I'll have the word become flesh and then as my son, he'll die. I'll let him die. As though God just said, that sounds like a good idea. It's not a good idea. It was the only way to maintain a righteous standard in undoing the godlessness, the sin, and the things that were done against God. It was the only way for that to be done. So therefore, when God was evaluating, how am I going to rescue creation? And he did this even before creation fell because it, it's in his wisdom. God is all wise, all knowing. So him choosing for his son to become flesh and die for the sins of the world is not a, an idea. It was the righteous requirement to maintain righteousness in delivering ungodly people and an ungodly creation in how to judge the world in righteousness and how to redeem those who are going to believe in righteousness, then righteousness within God, the counsel of God said, this is the only way. The word must become flesh. He must become flesh. There is no other way. So then when Jesus came time and he prayed three times in the garden and said, is there any other way? It was already a settled issue within God before Jesus became flesh. The flesh man was saying, the flesh part of him was saying, is there any other way? And God was like, no, 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 this is a settled issue. I knew before I created there was no other way. This is the only way for me to be able to get what I want and do what is necessary to be done to redeem ungodly people and be above reproach when it comes to righteousness. So that's what I am saying here when, when I say that satisfying righteousness and justifying, sanctifying, glorifying sinful men, this cost that it was the Son of God and it would take the cross, the cross was not the work of Roman soldiers. It was not the work of the Jews. It was the requirement of righteousness. Righteousness demanded if God is going to maintain righteousness and redeem ungodly, wicked people and transform them into the image of his son, this is the cost. And this was not designed by, by men or the devil. It said, had they known when they were crucifying him what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. This was the wisdom of God, knowing the righteous requirement of righteousness. Now, 
they did fulfill the role and it was evil what they did to him, but that was the demand to satisfy that a pure righteous man have the sin of the world dumped upon him. This is what righteousness required. Otherwise, righteousness says, and I'm saying again within God, not telling God what to do, but within God, righteousness would say, then you have no right to call those sinners righteous. You can't just do that because you're God, not and maintain righteousness yourself. Now, because you're all powerful, if you don't care about righteousness, you can do anything you want and no one can stop you because of your power. But if righteousness means something to you, you must do this. This is why God knew I must let things unfold this way. I must orchestrate. This event must happen and it must be the word of God become flesh. It must be. There is no other way. Now, again, I stress this so strong at the beginning of these lessons because righteousness is not a small issue. Righteousness demanded the death and suffering of Jesus. Righteous demanded it. Now, not because righteousness is mean, but because righteousness was saying, you're wanting to undo sin. That's no small task to undo sin. You can't just, like I have these blackboards, you can't just spray stuff on there and erase it and act like it never happened. Not and be righteous, you can't. If you're going to deal with this righteously above reproach so that throughout all the ages, no accusation can ever be brought against you of injustice, then this must happen. And God in his wisdom was able to pull this whole thing off he foreordained that. He planned it. Now, again, I'm saying this to elevate righteousness in our thinking, and as I said at the beginning, so that we will start thinking eternal, not just where you're going to go when you die, but start thinking eternal and start thinking of the demand of righteousness that required so much of God. And then the way we say about God redeeming us, that he redeemed us, and so just sit back and relax. Hey, he took care of everything. And I'm like, hold on. Surely righteousness still matters to God among his people. It will always matter. It will never be a small issue. Righteousness is not something that Jesus took care of on the cross and now can be violated without any consequence. No, God's saying it's not going to be violated ever. When I wrap this thing up, righteousness reigns. It says because Jesus hated lawlessness, and loved righteousness, God has exalted him. Righteousness is huge. So again, I'm saying this for us. This needs to start governing our thinking. Now, let's go to our next slide. I'm going to do like part A, part B. Okay. Now, what I'm wanting to do, if you look at that slide, you can see how I have a sort of a left side, right side, and then the bottom part. The gift of righteousness, Romans 5.17, is a declaration and material change of status. Now, when I'm saying that, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I, I've already covered 
As a matter of fact, let me just go over to that blackboard. That'll make this one easier, quicker to explain so I can get to my other blackboard. Okay, so what I wanted to say about the gift of righteousness is God can dwell with us, God can dwell in us, and God acts towards us as though we are actually righteous and had nothing to do with the death of his son. It wasn't our sins. Now, it was our sins. God knows that. But I'm saying he could act towards, dwell with, and dwell in us. This is what I'm meaning of a change of status. God's declaration is he declared us by this gift righteous, when in fact we're not really that changed yet. Most of us, the day after we got born again, other than we did, when I put on there materially, we actually were birthed again. We have new life in us. We are a new creation. And so all of this happened in this gift of righteousness. But if you were like me anyway, I can say my life did not dramatically change externally, I was a slow mover. Internally, I was different. Internally, I felt very guilty for sins that I committed, whereas when I committed them before, <laughs> I didn't lose any sleep over that. But when, when I received the gift of righteousness and God began to dwell in me, then I began to have inner feelings that kind of made me distraught and stuff. And the other thing is, God then put his Holy Spirit in us. Now, this is the gift of righteousness of which I'm talking about in Romans 5.17. And so now, Romans 5.17, so it's a declaration. He declares us righteous and material change of status, meaning we literally are a new creation and our status between us and God is different. It is different. But then there's the righteousness to the right of that where I put the righteousness of transformation. Now, that is not a biblical term. It is a biblical principle. I made up the term, the righteousness of transformation. But that's going to come from 1 John 3, 7, which we're going to read. And this is more the fruit of righteousness born out of transformation. So now I put a description down here of the righteousness of transformation. The righteousness of transformation is an infusion of the divine nature and character of Jesus. Now I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, but Jesus' divine nature is transferable to us. And Jesus was God become flesh. Now, our Father who's in heaven is God in heaven. But Jesus was God become flesh. He was different. And his nature is transferable. The Word of God says, as we bore the image of the first Adam, now we can bear the image of the last Adam, who is Jesus. And he's a life-giving spirit. So he's a little different. Well, he's no, dramatically different. But he's different. He is an Adam, meaning that means someone who can pass on to everyone after them. But he's the last Adam, the first Adam. But this last Adam was the Word become flesh, and he had the ability to pass on to us some attributes and capabilities. So the righteousness of transformation is an infusion. This is not the gift. The gift is one thing we're going to see. But the righteousness of transformation is an infusion of the divine nature and character of Jesus, the one who became flesh. Jesus himself was the only man who matured into a fully righteous man. Jesus is the only man who ever did that. How? By learning and living the obedient life 
as a man, acting on the Word of God and a Holy Spirit-led life. That's Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Now, what we're going to do, I want to read through these very quickly because I've already covered them. Romans 5, 17, and this is talking about the gift of righteousness. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, how much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now, I just want to draw your attention, just like I said, when God says, I judge righteously, then righteously is important about judging. Well, I want us to really notice the gift of righteousness. That means there is other righteousness that's not speaking of the gift. God is righteous, but he didn't get that as a gift. He is righteous. So him being righteous and the gift of righteous are not necessarily the same thing. Now, they're going to look the same and act the same, hopefully. But the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus. Now, I want to go to 1 John 3, 7. Now, this is the other righteousness. This is the transformation righteousness. 1 John 3, 7, little children, let no one deceive you. So, I want to say this. Let no one deceive you. There is righteousness that is different from the gift, related to the gift, but different from the gift. Listen to what he says. Little children, let no one deceive you. For he who practices righteousness, not he who has the gift, he who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, speaking of Jesus, is righteous. So notice what he says. He who practices righteous is righteous just as he is righteous. Well, the question is, do we want to be righteous like Jesus was righteous? Well, he was the perfect man. Of course we want to be. Well, that's why he gave us the gift. Well, he did give us the gift. It has a role. But here we're hearing from John that the practice of righteousness plays some type of role in me being as righteous just as he, Jesus, was righteous. So it kind of says you can't just lean on the gift. You can't just say, well, I got the gift. Well, you do have the gift. But there's something about practicing righteousness that helps you to be as righteous as he was righteous. And surely that's a noble goal. Surely that should be the desire of believers to be as righteous as we possibly can. And it seems to imply that we could be as righteous just as he is. Now, I am not implying we would ever reach deity status, that we would ever reach that we could claim we never had any kind of sin in our life in history. There's lots of things we can never be as he is. But it's implying there's a certain type of righteousness that Jesus attained to that is possible for us to attain to. So I'm not saying that we can reach some kind of status to when we're standing, you know, in the heavens or wherever with God and he's like, uh, golly, I'm getting you mixed up with my son who sits at my right hand because you are so righteous. I, are, are you Jesus or are you Donnie? That's never going to happen. I'm not even beginning to imply that. But what I am saying, there apparently is some form, realm, or type of righteousness that Jesus did attain to that I can be just as he is righteous. And I'm saying, if that's true, and here's what he says, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Well, then that says to me, it's true. It's true. 
God will never confuse me for Jesus. But it's true that there's some aspects of his life that are within my reach, if I will, if I will not be deceived by the people who proclaim today, just pray the prayer, lean on the gift, it's all by grace, solo fide, which means faith plus nothing. You don't have to do anything, no. I'm saying, oh no, let no one deceive you. There is a righteousness that can be lived that's going to matter. Let's go to the next slide. And I want to look back down at the bottom paragraph for a second. Jesus himself was the only man who matured into a fully righteous man. So the question is, is it possible that we can be a fully righteous man? I believe the Word of God is saying, yes, we can. So now that's what I'm wanting to focus on. Now look at this slide here. This is Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. I've covered this in a past lesson, but I want to put a little emphasis on this for this lesson. Listen to what this says now. Remember what I said at the beginning. Who demanded that the Word become flesh and dwell among us and then die for us? Righteousness. The righteousness within God Himself demanded the Word become flesh and dwell among us and die for our sins. Now, I believe it was God's intention that, that He become flesh, but I'm saying the demand for Him to die for our sins. Now, listen to what this says about this man, Jesus. Though He was a son, and not just a son, the unique son. Though He was a son, yet He learned. Learned? then this son was not walking in omniscience? No, he had to learn things. But look what he had to learn. Yet he learned obedience. Obedience? Now, wh what is this saying? Well, let me read through this and then I'm going to comment on it. Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, having been perfected, you mean he wasn't perfected to begin with? Was he less than perfect? That's not what this is saying. He became, he became something. He wasn't eternally this. He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, I'm going to pull this slide back up, and I want to walk through this because I want us to see something. Though he was a son, not just a son, the unique son, the only begotten of the Father. Listen to what he says. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience. What does this mean? He's saying as a man, he had to learn to obey God as a man. He was the Word of God become flesh, but he had never lived as a man. He became flesh. Now, when the word became is used, it means before whatever became or whoever became, it means before that, they were not that. The Word of God was not flesh for eternity past. There was a day when the Word of God became flesh. That means new territory. That means unknown territory for me. I've never walked as a man in the flesh. And listen to what it says. Yet he learned obedience. Can you imagine the Word of God who has never rebelled against the Father? That's not what he's saying. He's never rebelled against the Father, but the Word of God had to learn in this new status of being a man what it was to obey the omniscient, omnipotent Creator as a man. See, there was never this demand of this type of obedience in the heavens pre prior to our creation, but He became flesh. 
He learned obedience. Now, listen to this. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. This is not just talking about stripes on the back. This is talking about he had human desires. Remember in the wilderness, he was tempted 40 days. And we don't know what all happened in all those days, but I believe he was tempted the whole time, not just the temptations that are mentioned. And I believe that it required him to call out and say, Father, help me. These, I have desires that have just unleashed on me. And I don't want to do them, but I do want to do them. This is what he, he said. He was tempted in every way like we are. Have you ever been as a believer tempted to do something? You want to do it, but you don't want to do it? This is the suffering Jesus walked through. Jesus walked through all the way into adulthood as a man and suffered these temptations, but he never sinned. He never failed, but he did experience the temptations and the suffering, and he learned how to obey as a man. Therefore, he's a great high priest, because when we say, Jesus, I am struggling, he's like, I know what you're talking about. I did it. I prevailed. You can prevail now because of what I did, but I did it. So listen to what he says. And having been perfected, were, were there some, was there something wrong with Jesus? No. The English word perfected here would be better translated brought to maturity, brought to perfect manhood. This is the thing we have to remember. Now, I hope you know that Jesus, when he was born of Mary the Virgin, he wasn't born 33 years old adult. He had to mature physically. Well, I wonder if he had to mature emotionally. I wonder if he had to mature in the knowledge of God. Yes, because it said he increased in the knowledge of God. He grew in favor with God and men. So there's no question his life was a journey of reaching maturity. God was bringing him and maturing him. Now listen to what it says. And having been perfected or fully matured, what was fully matured? He didn't make it to 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old. What does it mean fully matured? It meant I have brought him to the place that he can face the ultimate temptation the ultimate battle, and that is to give up this life completely, loving not his life even unto death. Now, we have no reason to believe in Scripture that had they put Jesus on the cross at five years old that he would have held true. We have no reason in the scripture to believe that if they had whipped Jesus on that stake and gave him those stripes and ripped the skin off his back at three years old that he wouldn't have caved. But that's why God didn't let that happen then. God said, I'm maturing him as a man. I am making the ultimate man, but the ultimate man has to be built. He has to grow. He has to mature. He has to change. Now, he, unlike us, he was not changing from sinner to saint, but he was having to overcome the desires of a human being for self-preservation, the desires to become, the desires to have, the desires to do, the desire to be loved. And yet he was rejected, he was despised, he was abused, but he did not get there overnight. God matured him and brought him to the place that God had ordained for righteousness sake that he would have to face. And this is why it's saying he learned obedience. He had to learn that I have to obey, not just when it's an inconvenience to me, 
But even when, as Jesus said, my soul is troubled within me, I told y'all that definition of the words, it would be like the Niagara Falls, the troubled waters of the Niagara Falls. He said, that's going on inside of me. Jesus, you've cast out devils, healed the sick and raised the dead. You've seen the power of God like nobody else. You have the spirit without measure. How could you be troubled? Because I'm a man. I'm doing this as a man. But shall I say to my father, no, Lord, I can't do this. He said, it's for this reason that I came into the world so that I could grow up among men, face the life issues of men, prevail every time on every level. But God didn't let me face the cross at six years old. He grew me. Now I'm saying this folks because we're being grown for an event yet to happen. And we think it's all about, I prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer, it's a done deal. That would be like Jesus saying, I was born. It's a done deal. No, it wasn't a done deal. It was done that a virgin birthed a child, but that was just the beginning of a journey of transformation that was going to be come to this fullness when he was transformed and able. And God said, now I've brought you to this place. I've invested in you. I've taught you. I've trained you. I've opened the scripture to you. I've taught you obedience. And now you have become perfected. You are the ultimate perfect man. But even the ultimate perfect man, Adam was a perfect man. But even the ultimate perfect man, now you've got to face the death on the cross, the sins of the world, and you can't back up. So he prayed, Father, is there any other way? No, there is no other way. Then he's like, okay, then I'm going to do this. And he did it. Now listen. Then, verse 9, having been perfected, he became. This is what I'm talking about, us being eternally minded. Folks, it has not yet been revealed what we will be. We are in the process of becoming. And we look back at the cross and listen, I'm for the cross. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the cross. If the cross, if the cross was not, if our lives were not built upon what Jesus did on the cross, we have no life. There is no future. We're without God, without open the world, and everything's a waste of time. But the cross to us is the beginning. It's like the virgin birth. It's a miraculous birth. Now we enter into, and we want it said about us. There he is, and he became. Oh yeah, when I prayed the prayer, I became. No, Jesus was born of a virgin, but that was not the end. That was the beginning. Look at what it says. And having been perfected, matured, and become the perfect man, who would take this all the way to the bank, he became the author of eternal salvation. You know what that means? He was not the author of eternal salvation before that. He had to accomplish some things. He had to prevail at the cross to become the author of eternal salvation. This is why it says he became the author when? When he did what God had called him to do. He became the author of eternal salvation to all. Now look at those next words. Let me pull this over for you. To all who obey him. 
he's the author of eternal salvation for who whosoever will whosoever will what believe and what and obey him why what is this saying so I put down a question at the end which we're not gonna deal with what about those who don't obey him is he the author of eternal salvation for those who won't obey him well let me ask you this let's just go back to Jesus for a second if Jesus had not learned obedience through the things which he suffered would he be the author of eternal salvation to us no we wouldn't be saved but he did obey now the reason this says to all who obey him obedience we're going to see is the journey that Jesus walked our teacher our master and he said no student is above his teacher or his master it is enough that he's like his teacher or his master well what did our teacher master do he learned how to obey why because it brought him to maturity to then become what God ordained him to become Folks, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Paul said that. We're negotiating with what we're going to be now. We're on a journey of becoming. But we don't know that. We think, no, oh, it's all done, it's all done. I'm going to read this slide and then I'm going to go to this other blackboard and I can see we're not going to get to the part two of the lessons. So we have to do part two next week. Okay, let me read this to you. Transformation is the actual changing of you. It's the actual changing of you. Now, in a past lesson, I read the definition of actual. It means in fact, in act, in reality, actively. In fact, in act, in reality, actively. That's what actually means or actual. Transformation is the actual changing of you, not a declaration over you that goes beyond your standing that God can dwell with me because I'm in right standing with God and adoption that I've been adopted into the family of God afforded you by the wonderful gracious gift of righteousness God wants us to actually be conformed to the image of his unique son now we have misread it is finished at the cross he was meaning it is finished this leg of the journey but we know it doesn't mean everything's finished he hasn't returned yet established the millennial kingdom Satan has not been cast into the lake of fire there's a lot of things that aren't finished yet he was talking about the atonement is finished but we're not finished we're not finished folks we still got journey to go so again I want to read from Romans 8 29 for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that his son might be the firstborn among many brethren now I want to go over to this blackboard here and I'm only going to be able to introduce this uh, because <laughs> for the sake of time we're not going to be able to get I didn't know how far we would get but we've covered before now we were talking about the gift of righteousness this is the gift that God can dwell with us in us and as I stressed before in another lesson this gift that God gave to us of himself he did not have this extra money in his back pocket the gift of righteousness was something he 
had to purchase from his own resource he had to go and pay a great price remember the parable of the pearl and the field we need to realize god had to go pay a great price to buy he bought us but not with extra gold he had in his pocket he had to become flesh and dwell among us and suffer and that suffering folks i know we think well god's able to just kind of blink and make it disappear god knows every vile thing that's ever been uttered against him god knows everything you and i ever did against him god will carry forever the knowledge of those things when he says i remember your sins no more does he forget that king david did the bathsheba deal and it written in the word of god he didn't forget that when he says that i will not remember them he's saying i will not bring that to mind when i go to deal with you i will never deal with you according to your sins that you have received this gift. I'm not gonna deal with you on that. That's what he means when he says, I will remember it no more, but he does remember. Jesus remembers being on the cross. Jesus remembers the sins of the world being dumped on him. He remembers the vile things that people have said about him. He remembers getting slapped in the face, pulling his beard. He remembers those stripes. And in case he were to almost forget, which he never will, he still got the scars. That's why he was raised with the scars. Because he's saying, the wounds I carry, I carry forever. So this is the gift. Now, we look at this and we talked about at the very beginning of these lessons, the image of God. God created us, heart, soul, mind, and strength. These are divine attributes. I can think on the level of God. I don't mean I can think as high as he thinks. I can think in the realm in which God reveals things to me and my mind can say, I understand that. I see that. This is what I'm talking about, divine attributes. The heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength we have talked a lot about, these are divine attributes. God created us this way so that when we say, Lord, I love you, it's not like my dog loved me because I used to feed him, put food in his bowl. He was happy to see me. He had no value of me. He didn't know any of my values. He just knew I fed him. God does not want us to know him like a dog. He wants our minds thinking along the lines of his, our souls and our strength, everything towards being godlike. Now I'm saying that because of righteousness. This idea that because I've got the gift and no question this gift is extraordinary, but because I've got the gift, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what my heart, my soul, my mind, and strength are like. Sure it does. He said, I want you to love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the image of God is the way God created us. But then the gift right here, the gift of righteousness is justified, which means made righteous. These are all things that we'll read on our next week's lesson. Justified means made righteous. When we got this gift through faith in Jesus that he paid for, when we got this gift, God made us righteous or justified. It's the same Greek word, righteous and justified. He also sanctified us. And that means to be made holy. We were made holy. Now this doesn't mean we're walking this way. It means when we got the gift, we became righteous. 
We became holy. And these are the things we're going to go into next week. And then the third thing, and this some I have touched on, glorified. These are things Romans 8, 30, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and Hebrews 10, 10 talk about. God has already done these things. But, boy, I, I seem like I'm a far cry from that. Well, I am. And this is what we're wanting to understand, how this works. So we've been made righteous, made holy, and then this is such a good definition. I, I, I read through the, the Greek definitions to, to get a handle on glorified. And, and it's, oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. And I had to shorten it to turn it not into a long lesson itself. But it means to be made honorable. Get this, God. Golly. He made us honorable with divine dignity. He gave us value. He gave us divine value. Oh. That's to be glorified. This is part of the gift of righteousness. But I put here, it's in seed form. See, God created us with divine attributes so that we could, remember I said before, become something. God gave us divine attributes, but he didn't stop there. He then planted the gift of righteousness in seed form. He planted righteousness in us, holiness in us, and divine dignity and honor in us. He planted that divine seed in us when he gave us the gift of righteousness. But why? Because he's saying with these divine attributes, plus, I got a plus sign here, these divine, this divine seed, you can through obedience become what I wanted. Folks, we're still in process of becoming. And you know what we're going to become? We're going to become actually righteous. It's not just going to be in seed form. Actually holy. It's not going to be just in seed form. And we can, <laughs> this is next week's lesson, we can be made honorable with divine dignity that is going to bring such glory to God, glory to His Son, and glory to us if we will follow in the footsteps of our Master, our Teacher, our Lord, who learned obedience and became the author of eternal salvation. He became many things, but that's one of the things we just read. He became. He was given a name now above every name that can be named in heaven. There's that divine dignity and honor that God has exalted His name. Why? Because He learned obedience. He learned to obey. He learned to be transformed and matured into all that He could be as a man. He didn't get these things after he raised, went to the heavens because of things he did in the heavens, it's what he did here in the form of a man that allowed God to exalt him to where he is the Lord of heaven and earth and only God the Father is above him. He did that as a man. Now, I know he was God in the flesh, but he faced 
that change and transformation of being matured into the image that you and I can also attain to, not on the level of him, but there is something that Paul said, it has not yet entered in to our minds. We, we don't even know what it's going to be like to be glorified with that honor and divine dignity that's going to bloom when we learn to obey because we have the divine attributes of God. We have the divine seed that's planted in the gift. And now he says, learn, learn to obey. And then you can be transformed into the image of my son. Now we're going to stop there because we're out of time. So, and, and I actually had a halfway point right there. I thought I would get further than I did. Folks, get your eyes on destiny and becoming. Destiny and becoming. And I don't mean the kind of, oh, hold on, I forgot that, that I wasn't on there with y'all. <laughs> on, on destiny and becoming. And I don't mean destiny as when we all get to heaven and see Aunt May and Uncle Joe. No. I have a day set before me when I am going to become. And I don't even know what it's going to be. But I do know what matters to what I'm going to be. And that is that I press towards the mark of the upward call that I reach towards transformation, being conformed to the image of the Son, because just as it is with Jesus himself, it's what he did in the flesh in this life that brought him to the position where he is now. Of the divine, that just blessed me so much, divine dignity and honor. It is going to be so awesome to be able to stand before God in divine dignity and honor. Because of him, this is all possible because of him. But he is saying, be like my son who loved not his life even unto death that he might please me. And now I have heaped on him glory and honor and power. And you can't think like a human, you know, oh, you're just wanting glory and honor. I want divine dignity before God. I do want to be honored by God. As Paul said, I'm not seeking the praise that comes from men, but from him. And this is available for all of us. This is not just, this is not for the Apostle Pauls of the world or the Billy Grahams of the world. This is for anyone who sets their eye on the goal of being transformed into the image of the Son who learned obedience through telling himself no to the things that would pull him away from being changed and transformed and conformed to the image of the Son. And that's what we're going to do. Amen. Let's stop. Father, we come to you, and Lord, we love you. We worship you. Who is like our God? There's nobody. Nobody that could understand how to turn wicked men into people who have divine dignity before God, who can be honored by God righteously. Who is like our God? There is none, none, none. 
Father, we worship you. We love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Thank you for what you did. And that now you've passed on to us the ability to become in the age to come. And Lord, we're asking you, Holy Spirit, we're asking you, open our understanding and deal with us. We know that it's not always comfortable when you deal with us. But we're asking you, deal with us, confront us. We want to be people who are blessed with the honor and divine dignity of God, that before Him we're an honor. Lord, we thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for teaching, leading, guiding, helping us to become everything you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to see as Moses saw. He left the riches of Egypt as having seen him who's invisible. Show us, Lord, within this, these, these divine attributes of God that you've placed within us, in us, the image of God. Let it begin to grow inside our minds and hearts and that we see where we're going, we see what we're to do, and that we become everything you've called us to become and to do. We thank you for this. Lord, we just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.